Sandro Botticelli was one of the most important artists of the 15th century, working under the wing of the Medici family. His style of painting focuses on building an image through a line as the shapes he paints are always slightly shaded. Botticelli's spring has been the subject of interpretations by scholars, art critics, and even ordinary art lovers for centuries. This painting is a combination of mastery, symbolism, mythology, and intertwining meanings and meanings that make it a serious conundrum to this day. In today's video, we will give you some starting points for reflection and will introduce you to the characters in the painting with which Botticelli challenges the deductive and interpretive thinking of art critics. Without claiming to be exhaustive, we will try to present our interpretation. Botticelli's spring is a large panel measuring 2.03 meters to 3.1 meters, according to various sources was created in the period around 1477 to 1482. The painting is currently kept in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. In purely compositional terms, spring contains nine characters, six female figures, three males, and a small cupid figure on the background of an orange grove, the meaning of which we will try to interpret later. The latest restoration, during which the pollution was removed, makes it possible to see spring almost in its original form. Scientists have been able to identify more than 500 really existing plants. It should be noted that Sandro Botticelli was a lover of botany, he painstakingly painted leaves, flowers, and fruits in all his paintings. In the painting spring, experts find over 200 types of flowers. An important key to understanding spring is the context in which the painting is painted. The purpose of the painting was to decorate the bedroom of Lorenzo di Pier Francesco, cousin of the mighty Lorenzo the Magnificent Medici, after his wedding, and the first wedding night will be the first time his wife sees the painting. The orange grove in which the whole action takes place is a reference to the genus of the Medici. As we know, the orange tree is a symbol of their genus and appears in many works of art created under their care. As in most cases, an analysis always has as its starting point the title of a work, be it a picture, a poem, or another form of human self-expression. The interesting thing in this case, however, is that we owe the name Spring to the historian Giorgio Vasari, who first mentioned her name. This will be our starting point because we are accustomed to the perception that behind a word is usually the image of a certain object, idea, or implied essence of the visible and invisible world. If we assume that Botticelli would also give the title spring to his painting, then on a subconscious level, what he depicts on the canvas should correspond to the idea of spring, namely a new birth, a new beginning. This idea finds some confirmation in the fact that one of the identified characters is Flora, goddess from the Roman mythology of fertility and spring. Undoubtedly, the image unequivocally confirms that it is this goddess. The wreath on her head, the garland of flowers around her neck, and the many flowers she pours from her robe on the ground, scattering spring. However, if Botticelli's main idea was to depict spring, or rather the flowering of spring, of new life, why is this character not central in purely compositional terms? If we look at the picture, Flora is depicted almost to the far right of the canvas, near a male and female character who resembles Chloris and Zephyr. 
We know from Greek mythology that Chloris is an equivalent image of Flora. In ancient Greece, she was worshipped as a nymph of fertility and spring, and Zephyr, the god of the west wind, was also her husband and forerunner. According to the legend, Zephyr came and attacked Chloris, with which he was in love. In the picture, Chloris is trying to protect herself from Zephyr, who rushes over her. This scene transforms the defeated nymph into the goddess Flora. In the picture we see the pregnant Flora scattering her children, the flowers in the orange garden. Many art critics believe that Botticelli used this reference as his main message and wish to the betrothed couple of the Medici. According to some critics, the marriage of Lorenzo di Pier Francesco and his fiancée was intentional and violent, just as the lustful Chloris was not in love with Zephyr. However, Botticelli hints that any marriage can flourish after the creation of a new life. The painting depicts Chloris running away from Zephyr, but immediately after her transformation into a pregnant Flora, she is calm and blissful, bringing new life around. In this line of thought, in the right corner of the picture, there is a semantically equivalent trio of three deities, directly carrying the idea of spring and fertility. If Flora pours flowers from her robe on the ground, Chloris, pursued by her husband Zephyr, scatters such flowers from her mouth. A verse by Ovid, which says that while speaking her lips exhale red roses. If Botticelli wanted to depict spring, shouldn't this motif be central? And if we are talking about spring, how should this spring be perceived? As the birth of new life, as cyclicality, as a symbol bearing direct associations with ideas of greatness and triumph? Maybe the other images in the picture would give us a partial answer. On the far left is the figure of Mercury, which uses its caduceus or scepter to repel a bunch of small and grey clouds and make way for the coming spring. The image is expressive enough and there is no doubt that it is the messenger of the gods, the wings of his sandals and his specific helmet. If we refer again to Greco-Roman mythology, Mercury is an admirer of Chloris and was in rivalry with Zephyr. The two outer corners of the picture are somehow semantically united if we assume that the image of Mercury hints at this very essence of it. If we accept this interpretation, this arrangement of characters is reminiscent of the birth of Venus, where the goddess is surrounded on both sides by Flora, on the one hand, and Chloris and Zephyr, pouring flowers on the other. This order of interpretation is meaningful and logical if we note the presence of the other three female characters, which form a mythological whole, namely the three graces, Aglaea, Euphrosyne, and Talia. In Greek mythology, these deities are called Kariti or Heretai, hence the word charisma, namely the charm or magical charm inherent in Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. In a purely mythological storyline, the very birth of Venus should be presented near water, as we know it is born from the foam of water and hides its nakedness with parts of its hair, which element in the picture spring is missing. Here she is depicted wearing an all-white dress, but with a two-tone cloak, red on one side and blue on the other, and above her head is Cupid with a blindfold and arrows in his hands. As we know, Cupid is the son of Venus, her companion and the main cause of love. Cupid's character in this picture is important due to several important mythological facts. According to Cicero, Cupid is the fruit of the love between Mercury and Diana, which would explain another reason for the depiction of Mercury in spring, but most often Cupid is presented as the son of Mars and Venus, somehow reconciling the binary beginning, I, E, life and death, the heavenly and the earthly, the sacred and the priceless. If we assume that here the figure of Cupid embodies this image as well, then somehow the cloak of Venus itself finds its explanation. As we pointed out, it is two-tone, red-blue. Red is a symbol of love, soul, heart, but it is also a symbol of the sun giving birth to new life in the earthly beginning. Blue, in turn, is in direct association with the most intangible, the most empty color, the purest and coldest, 
Here we see some idea of the celestial beginning, e in some peculiar way this seemingly insignificant cloak hints at the idea of the eternal battle between heaven and earth. From what has been said so far, Venus and Cupid are representations of both the earthly and the heavenly, personifications of the earthly, but also of heavenly, divine, love. As we mentioned above, Venus, being the central image, is surrounded by two groups of characters, Mercury and the three graces on the left, and the right corner is occupied by Flora, Chloris, and Zephyr. A similar distinction between earthly, heavenly or physical spiritual could be seen in the groups thus defined. Mercury and the three graces are emanations of the higher virtues, of the spiritual world, Flora and her companions absorb the idea of matter, spring, giving a new beginning, the life-giving substance. Venus, depicted in the middle, is a dividing line between the two worlds, but also a unifying and intersecting point. Leaving out the many possible interpretations proposed by various experts, what is certain is the humanistic meaning of the work, Venus is the goodwill, the humanitas, as she distinguishes the material, right, from the spiritual values, left. The humanitas promotes the ideal of a positive man, confident in his abilities, and sensitive to the needs of others. This ancient conception was on the way to Renaissance humanism and Neoplatonic ideals moving around the Medici court. Neoplatonism was a philosophical and aesthetic movement trying to blend the thought of Greek philosopher Plato with the noblest concepts of Christianity. The Neoplatonic conception of the ideal beauty and the absolute love influenced the Renaissance culture and Botticelli. We can therefore imagine that behind the philosophical interpretation of the painting, Botticelli and his client thought of an apology for the Medici and their sophisticated, far-sighted and deep love for culture and art. If you liked the video, you can subscribe to the channel, like the video, or share it. This will be a sign for us that we are doing something valuable.